Perfect. Um, so now what I'll do is I'll hide this video panel. Okay. Is everything clear? Perfect. Perfect. Very Perfect. good. Thank you. Thanks, Bronson, uh, for sending the invite. And I'm pretty excited to share um, some one of the things that we started about two, two and a half years back, which is on polariton lasing. Um, and this is something that we bumped into kind of trying to understand. Uh, coming from a very background of spectroscopy, we tried to figure out how can we see polaritons in organic semiconductors. And then once we started seeing those, then the next thing was, can we actually make devices out of them? And as one thing leads to another, that as often happens in science. And next thing we knew that we actually were successful in demonstrating organic polariton lasing from uh, perylene diamides. So in the next few slides, I'm going to take you through what we have done. I'm sorry, I can't, sorry. Uh, I just can't seem to be able to change my slides. Okay, perfect. Um, so what I'm going to um, talk about today is what are excitons first in what are excitons, what are exciton polaritons, importance of polaritons, and then looking into polaritons in organic semiconductor crystals, and then followed by a demonstration of polariton lasing. So as we often, like we have known about what are excitons, something that we have often, you know, most of us know already, and we have encountered it in mostly all the organic semiconductor materials that we see because of their low, um, low dielectric constant, they can support this coulombically bond electron hole pair. Um, this can be approximated as a dispersion list because the energy remains wherever and however you shine light on this molecule. So what I have shown over here is essentially that this is a dispersion list um, entity. And as I've drawn that as an horizontal line representing an exciton. So no matter how you excite at what angle you excite, the band gap, the energy of excitation remains the same. Now, one thing we have also discovered that it's not necessarily just the molecule. When we bring two molecules together, the excitonic behavior can change. And this is often, most of us have looked into H and J type aggregates, where H type aggregates are the one which allow higher energy excitations. And you see mostly accompanied with um, low radiative uh, PLQI. However, in J type aggregates, which is basically going from head to tail, what we see that this specific arrangement allows um, low energy excitations. And we often see really high PLQYs and often super radiance as well. But what you're looking at is bringing two molecules close together. And when these two molecules are brought together, there's an energy splitting, often known as um, exciton coupling. And, you know, and the, the energy difference is the what you see as a as basically a marker of any coupled molecular system. And often when you bring a lot more molecules together, what you see is uh, you can see a lot of these energy states. And what you see eventually is different processes. You can see diffusion, which is the energy going across different density of states, often also referred to as energy transfer. And you can also see a non-radiative thermalization where the energy trickles down to the lower vibration state. And that's what you see in aggregate. So often this is how we have always, we always think about exciton and exciton photophysics. But now in all of these scenarios, we are dealing with coupling between two excitons, coupling between two molecular, um, uh, molecular excitons. However, um, what I'm going to kind of discuss today is what would happen if you bring, um, couple the molecular exciton with the cavity. So once we think about cavity is nothing but you put two mirrors and between these two mirrors, you can have, you can support different modes, which means you can support right from half a wavelength to full wavelength and so on and so forth. And what that is determined is by basically the length of the cavity is exactly the same. So what you're doing as, as you go higher modes, you're actually um, supporting uh, smaller uh, wavelengths. And what you see is that for a given cavity thickness, only certain wavelengths will satisfy the conditions because at boundary conditions, um, there have to be uh, these nodes. Uh, and as a result of that, what you see is that the cavity actually follows essentially uh, the dispersion which you see over here. So 
in the last slide, I had drawn a horizontal line for exciton, saying it's a dispersionless quantity, no matter how you excite and which angle you excite, you will essentially see the same um, excitonic behavior. However, in the cavity, it's a bit different because the different angles will kind of have different wavelengths that will be supported, hence different frequencies and different energies will be supported. So what you see over here is a cavity in exciton. And especially if you pay attention to this place where you have cavity in exciton coming very close together is where you can actually initiate coupling between them. So if I bring a bit further on how we can do that. So this is how I had put together what an exciton is. We dealt with Frenkel exciton, bound excitons in organic semiconductors. This is how I describe cavity modes. And if you bring them together, which is to say, if you take a molecule and put it inside the cavity in such a way that the excitation and emission of the um, excitation of the Frankel exciton is in resonance with the wavelength supported inside the cavity, you can see the superposition between a wave and um, excitation and emission process. So you can imagine that when you shine light at this system, there is going to be an excitation absorbance process when the light is emitted. This light em emitted light will bounce back from the cavity, will get reabsorbed by a molecule, which again will have an absorbance event. When it emits, it again will get reflected by the cavity. And if these events happen quite fast and there are numerous molecules supporting this, what you would see is that there will be a superposition of a cavity supported wave and an exciton and emission, uh, absorbance and emission events which are happening in a molecule. And in fact, if you take snapshots at different time intervals, you will see that the population of excited states and ground states is near about equal because they are having absorption and emission events pretty much at the same time and essentially in the superposition of each other. So what you see is basically a coupling between a cavity photon and an exciton, which is a molecular exciton. And that's that quasi state is called a polariton. Um, and what and how we typically study is we take silver mirrors, put the thin film between those mirrors. Of course, this thin film is made up of molecules. Um, and often we want these molecules to be separated from each other to reduce any thermalization issues or any other loss mechanism. So if these molecules are well separated from each other, you can support a lot more polariton modes without any uh, decay mechanisms. Because you can imagine if your cavity is leaky cavity, you will actually not be able to support a standing wave properly. Or on the other hand, if your molecular exciton is aggregated, you will see a lot of thermalization issues. And because of the thermalization or absorption and emission events will not be basically synchronized with each other. And eventually you will lose the phase characteristics. So what you would essentially want is to minimize errors, uh, minimize decay mechanisms in molecular excitons, that is thermalization. So having molecularly insulated separated molecules support that. And you would want to have a good cavity that it can support a stationary wave for a relatively longer time. So what you can do is by thinking about bringing molecules and cavities together, what you see is at this basically junction, you see a splitting. And this splitting is called, called Rabi splitting. And what you see is splitting of two energy states. Now, if we drew an analogous picture to what I have shown in the previous slides, when I brought two molecules together, here I'm bringing an exciton and a photon together, and you see split into energy states called lower and upper polariton. Here I've just shown a picture essentially showing how a cavity mode, dispersion cavity mode, and dispersionless exciton mode would show the similar polariton splittings. So Rabi splitting is essentially what we are looking for in most of the systems where we want to see strong coupling between a molecular exciton and a stationary wave inside a cavity. Now, why is it important? What does it do? One of the things which you can demonstrate with this strong coupling is called polyelectron lasing. Uh, so the question is, how does this type of lasing differ from photon lasing? So one of the things, as I kind of uh, discussed a bit uh, a couple of minutes ago, that in polaritons you have pretty much equal population of excited and ground states. So essentially it follows Bose-Einstein condensate characteristics. I'm not saying it's a Bose-Einstein condensate. It's totally a different debate altogether, but it shows characteristics of Bose-Einstein condensate. Now, photon lasing, what we see is essentially you need a population inversion, which is where you need a lot more 
uh, excited state molecules in the ground state one. And what you see is that exciton is the gain media. And often this is observed in weak coupling uh, because all you're doing is looking for population inversion and stimulated emission. However, in polariton lasing totally different, you need a lot more polaritons, more the polaritons that you have. Essentially polariton is your gain media, more the polaritons, they are in sync with each other. They share the same phase characteristics. And that's how you see your uh, uh, emission. And this emission is essentially a stimulated scattering um, and not necessarily a stimulated emission. What you see is all the emission is happening. All the emission events are essentially spontaneous emission events, but they're all in the same phase. So what you see is there is a key difference. You do not need any inversion. Polariton is the gain medium. Uh, so the first report in polariton lasing was demonstrated by Forrest in 2010 um, from organic crystals, which are these anthracene crystals. And what he observed was basically the lower polariton and the upper polariton. And because anthracene also has these vibrational states, you can also see middle polariton branches. And what, what, he, what he was shown was that if you excite a molecule at any of these higher energy state, what you see is that the energy trickles down to the lower polariton band, which is at k equal to zero. And what you would see is essentially an emission. And this emission increases sharply as you increase the pulse intensity. And that's basically the evidence of you seeing a lasing process. Um, you can easily see a threshold over here that you go from a linear to a non-linear behavior. And you also see that the full width half maximum actually reduces, shrinks quite a lot. So you see that the full width half maximum actually goes down to 12 milli, uh, milli electron volt. So some of the characteristics of lasing that you see over here straight away are localized exciton, spectral narrowing, and, uh, and the fact that you have huge increases emission uh, which is non-linear with respect to pump intensity. Um, so one of the things which we got excited about was that it was only 10 years back that polariton lasing was shown and that too from crystals. And the only, we started questioning, are there any materials that have shown this uh, where you can just spin coat them in poly and dispersed in polymer matrix? And the only example we find is body P dye. So we started thinking about, can we actually look into different material classes where we, where we can easily spin code these materials and they can demonstrate this lasing. And the idea was that once we understand which material class is important, we would be able to figure out a clearer direction for device improvement. And one of the key motivations is because you do not need population inversion in this, effectively you can observe much lower thresholds than conventional, uh, uh, conventional stimulated emission lasing that we uh, have observed in organic semiconductors till date. So the idea to go towards lower threshold, low power driven laser was the key motivation. And then since there were not many molecules discovered, we started figuring, let's see if we can find new molecules and figure out what are the molecular parameters that underpin this effect. So we started looking into all the properties, what is required, uh, so we narrow it down to four or five material properties that you need. You need large oscillator strength. You need a small stroke shift. So you have low thermalization losses, really narrow line widths. Again, this feeds again back down to we need large radiative high PLQYs as well. Uh, and of course, we need a fast radiative rate. So essentially for lasing, we would want that. We want minimum non-radiative losses. Um, one of the ways to figure out if a material strongly couples to the cavity is via Rabi splitting. So to get high Rabi splitting, it depends on how good the cavity is, how good your material absorbance is. That's why we are looking for large oscillator strength material. Your cavity length in sense how much absorbance can take place. And essentially the narrow line widths of absorbance is what we are looking at. Uh, so the line width of excitons and cavity has to be narrow enough so that we can couple them strongly. So one of the things we looked into was these five materials till date that have shown high Rabi splitting. And among that, only BODP has shown polariton lasing. Green fluorescent protein has also shown nice polariton lasing. And so does MELPPP. However, most of these materials, anthracene is in crystals and the only BODP is the material which is dispersed in the dye, easily spin coatable and uh, has shown polariton lasing. So we started our quest. Some one material that we have often been offers high PLQI, really narrow uh, line widths was basically perilens. So we just started 
thinking and looking into parallels. And the way to figure out was which material is good. Uh, you would need a material that does not aggregate. You would need material that, um, that, that material that has basically very small stoke shift. Plus also you would need material that can absorb light, which means that you can load it inside the cavity a lot without initiating aggregation. So that's how we figured that if we have a material which has bulky side groups, it will prevent aggregation. But at the same time, we also knew that this will not give us sufficient dye loading inside the cavity. So we figured the other end would be that make a simple perillin, which has no bulky side groups, which is where we can load it inside the cavity a lot. But then there is a risk, of course, is that you can see aggregation. So we thought that it's best to carry out a methodical study to first figure out which dye, what kind of uh, properties are required. So we looked into all these properties. I'm going to quickly go through that. Um, in order to study these, one of the things which we do is we make a silver mirrors on both sides, which is basically a poor man's cavity. It's sufficiently well to characterize Rabi splitting, but it's not sufficient to show lasing because these are very leaky mirrors. But however, to just characterize, to identify screen materials, this was perfect. So what we started was we looked into two silver mirrors, we put a thin film, uh, we took our dyes, dispersed it in PMMA matrix, and actually build this Fabry pyro cavity device. And then what we do is we shine light at different angles. So if you remember my previous slides, because your cavity has a dispersion, however, your exciton is not. And when they actually are very close together, you see an anti-crossing behavior, which is where you can determine Rabi splitting. And that's what we figured was if we put this cavity inside and we shine at different angles, we should be able to see that. And that's exactly what you see over here. So when you increase the angles, what you're seeing is that you're seeing a splitting between, so this is your absorbance peak. So X1 is first absorbance peak, X2 is second absorbance peak. And what you're seeing is if you increase the angles, there is a dip that you see in these absorbance peak. And this is because of Rabi splitting, because of the anti-crossing behavior. So at Rabi splitting, there is no absorbance, the light gets entirely reflected. So what you're seeing is basically a drop off this behavior. So when we shine light at different angles, we can see, um, we can monitor our be splitting. Um, the way to do that is by changing angles, we can pick, pick up different peaks and where it actually drops and we can plot it in a diagram that's shown over here. So what we see is essentially these are the excitonic peaks and we can see the splits that are observed. So in this material, which had perillins, which had no bulky side groups, a simple rigid material, what you see is you can get Rabi splitting up to 120 to 130 milli electron volt. This is quite remarkable because a lot of these materials do not show more than 80 to 100 milli electron volt. So we were pretty pumped when we saw this high Rabi splitting. However, when we looked into the emission, emission is actually coming from aggregates. Essentially, if you want a good laser, you would want the emission to actually track down or basically be from the lower polariton band. But what's happening is no matter where you excite the material, the emission is coming from the aggregates, which means that we have no, even though we have strong coupling, but our emission is totally off phase with what our excitation is. So of course this material is not suitable for polariton lasing. So what we did was we actually went into looking into other materials. And what we see was that when we put up materials with a bit, bit more bulkier side groups, the solubility ended up decreasing. However, what we were seeing is that again, in this BPDI2, what you see is again, the emission is below the lower polariton band. So even though we have achieved reasonable strong coupling, but again, the emission does not overlap with the lower polariton band. Hence, there's no this is going to be cloud with basically thermalization losses. And when we go to monomeric, and when we go to really, really bulkier group, you can see how nicely emission overlaps basically with the lower polariton band. And this is what made us very excited that this is a really good material. However, the problem is that the Rabi splitting is quite low because these are bulky side groups. You cannot, you have very poor solubility. Eventually, the only material that fit the bill was basically a trade off between one that can be kind of loaded quite nicely into the cavity, but at the same time also had lower polariton and the emission actually overlap on each other. And this is what was really remarkable because you can see that the lower polariton band 
kind of overlays with nice, very nicely with the emission band, which means that you can actually see a emission from the lower polariton band. So, and that got us pretty excited. Um, so what we did was the next thing was to demonstrate polariton lasing. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to demonstrate how we went about that. So as I said, silver mirrors basically are poor cavities. So often they're so leaky cavities that you cannot support strong coupling for a long time. So what we wanted to essentially do was we started making Bragg DBR mirrors. And this actually took better part of a year for us because as I said, we started this project two years, two and a half years back, really new to this. So we had to learn ourselves on how to make these mirrors. So of course, bottom mirror, making bottom mirror as basically alternate layers of silica and tantalum pentoxide was fine. However, when we put our material and we started putting the top mirrors, we always saw that they were cracked. And it took us quite some time to figure out why they were cracked. And it was essentially because the PMMA matrix somehow was not supporting. And that's where the PMMA matrix was giving away when these thermal evaporation was happening at relatively high temperatures. So we actually then tried out different matrices and polystyrene matrix was actually worked well. So we dispersed our BPDI molecules into poly polystyrene matrix. Then we can again see very nice Rabi splittings. So Rabi splittings here are a bit low, which is quite natural because in silver mirrors and DBRs, in DBR mirrors, your stationary wave actually penetrates through the DBR mirrors quite, quite a lot. Hence the Rabi splitting typically decreases. You can easily see that our quality factor of our DBRs is about 760. This in compared to silver mirror, silver mirrors have Q factors about 20. So you can see this 35 times increase is basically what helps us in supporting strong coupling in these films. So of course we have now demonstrated that Rabi splitting can be supported in DBR mirrors as well. This is the last slide where we actually demonstrate how we see polariton lasing. So we pumped this cavity, we pumped our cavity device with 150 femtosecond pulse using a TISAF with a BBO crystal, so getting a 390, which is where you can populate the upper polariton band. And what we see is that actually when you increase the fluence, you have a sharp increase in the intensity, which is a nonlinear increase, which is the first sign of demonstrating lasing. And what we also see was that there was a clear blue shift this a blue shift is very essential to demonstrate polariton lasing. Every polariton lasing is accompanied by a blue shift because of course you're exciting at basically the upper bands and the emission is coming from K equal to zero. So what you're seeing is that there has to be a blue shift accompanying a polariton emission. And we see that it's about two milli electron shift. Another characteristic is that the emission has to be coherent and directional in nature because it's coming from K equal to zero. And what we see that is below threshold and above threshold, you can easily see that the spot appears which demonstrates directionality. And this happens at about 250 microjoules is where your turn on for lasing is. Another way to differentiate that our lasing was indeed uh, different from amplified spontaneous emission. You can see amplified spontaneous emission relatively essentially 0.15 electron volt as the, um, as the bandwidth. However, uh, when you see the lasing polariton lasing that we have seen is extremely narrow, high intensity. And we can easily, we did multiple measurements at different spots at different wavelengths to demonstrate that this was in fact quite a sharp emission coming from polaritonic effects. And you can see that the cavity resonance is far more bluer than it should be. So hence, this is not photonic effects either. So if we were to look into blue shifts, fluence dependence, threshold behavior, and wavelength narrowing all pointed down to the fact that we have achieved polariton lasing from these matrices or from BPDI parallels in polystyrene matrix. So just to conclude and provide you what we are going, where we are going next, conclusion is we, of course, we have figured out a new materials which peril and die that offers really high Rabi splitting and really high PLQIs and very rare do we see materials fitting this bill. In fact, I would be so bold to say that perilin is the only material which can offer really high Rabi splittings while maintaining high PLQI. Uh, demonstrated optical pol pump polariton lasing, we saw that in polystyrene matrices within DBR cavity. This is the only second small molecule dye to have shown this. So uh, as you can understand that this was pretty exciting for us. Um, and 
Our reported threshold are still in a bit higher type than what has been observed in BODP, but I think this is because we carry out our experiment in ambient conditions, whereas everybody else does it at inert atmosphere. So carrying out experiments in ambient condition made the dye to photo oxidize quite quickly, and hence the thresholds are a bit higher. Um, the next steps for us are to continue identifying new materials dyes, something we have collaborated with Lawrence and Ebenezer from AU Chaos community as well on DPPs. And this is something that we are uh, looking forward in, into the future collaboration as well. And also use this perilens, but instead of optically pump them, go towards the holy grail of electrically injected lasing, um, which essentially apart from uh, Adachi who recently showed uh, in electrically injected lasing, nobody else has gone up, has demonstrated that. And in fact, nobody has demonstrated electrically injected polariton lasing. So it's quite a blue sky goal for us, but I, I think we are on we are on track. Um, before, to, before I stop, I want to acknowledge my group members, my collaborators, especially Wallace for providing BPDI materials and uh, Pega and Casper helping us out with the DBR mirrors. Of course, a lot of the work was done by Randy Sabatini, who has now moved to University of Toronto for his second postdoc. Um, the work has been carried out by Patrick. Um, Yoon is actually making transistors involving strong coupling and Julian is actually using polaritons to enhance solar cell efficiencies. So there's a lot of work going on in polaritonics in our Yes, which also brings me down. I was thinking I'll see a lot more students and postdocs today. So I had put this one slide for postdoc positions available. Um, so all the supervisors in there, please do um, send. If you have candidates who are interested in these two positions, please do forward. Uh, please do tell them to write to me. Uh, essentially in our research group, we are looking into excitonic devices, controlling energy lifetime, delocalization and spin. We have a very ambitious goal of actually going bottom top, tailoring aggregates and then making them, putting them into devices. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a long-term goal, but yeah, I, I see that we have made inroads into pretty much all the devices and as well as supramolecular chemistry. So I don't know why we can't get there. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to stop here and um, throw it back to Bronson. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. I'm sure you join me in uh, in thanking Girish for a very interesting uh, presentation. We we have uh, we have not very much time, but uh, I, I see a quick question. Laszlo's jumped in. Uh, if no inversion is required, why is a threshold observed? The threshold is observed for multiple reasons because what you're looking at is when you're looking for strong coupling, what you're building is a polariton density. And once you build huge polariton density, um, then what happens is this polariton starts scattering. And once that scattering events happen, what you see is because of the scattering events, a lot more polaritons drop down to k equal to zero. And that's where the spontaneous coherent emission starts. So in order to build, in order to have that emission process happening from k equal to zero, you need sufficient polariton density and so, to, so as to initiate polariton scattering. And that's where the threshold happens. When you're increasing the light intensity, you're essentially building up population of polaritons. And at some point you see a scattering events happening and those scattering events actually then lead to emission. All right, thank you. Um, I think we, we, we don't have enough time for any other questions because um, we need to get on with uh, the second presentation, but thank you very much uh, for a very interesting talk. There. Um, thank you. Um, so 